I'm really excited about this webinar. But for those who don't know me, my name is Rai, pronouns are she, her. I am a trans femme person based in Elodie Land, Oakland, California. And I am the Community Education Program Manager here at Bloom. Really excited to be hosting this event around fashion outside the binary with Origami Customs founder themselves, Ray Hill. Ray, we've been, you and I have been having amazing conversations around like, what does it mean to provide uh, really like tangible resources around fashion? And also like, you know, there's, there's like the binary fashion in sense of maybe for safety and survival, but then there's also like the gender free and expansive type of fashion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that just has so many worlds of possibilities. And I think that like fashion can be used as a way to like really dive deeper into your self expression and your, your self discovery on top of and also without even without stuff like HRT as well so yeah, thank you so exactly. much for being here and yeah. if there's anything else you want to share about that go ahead I mean I've just been so excited to develop this with you I think there's a lot of content going around right now for this week in Transit Remembrance but this feels like something that's very like relevant and also nuanced and like you were saying it really ties into our identities it's about being trans but it's also not about being trans you know, there's a lot in here. There's a lot of practical advice, but a lot of like us thinking about what it means to exist in this time and place and how to express our identities in ways that feel, like you said, expressive, but also safe. Yeah, so I'm really, really excited to present this one. Oh, yeah. Just like a quick acknowledgement about what the space is going to be. It's going to be an up, about an hour and a half long with a Q&A at the end. There will be some sections for reflections that we'll ask questions on with y'all. And there will also be a live demonstration on how to measure your body to get like the specific measurements so you can find clo that clothing that fits for you or custom make them. But just some quick acknowledgements, you know, we know that clothing can feel really gender free and expansive, but also finding clothing that fits well and feels authentically, you can feel really challenging. Um, there's also you know, a lot of things around safety and survival and just like dysphoria, euphoria and mm -hmm. comfortability and just like being perceived in public. And, you know, like I, all of those things are here in the room with us right now on top of like the joy and the love and the care that we get to experience together when we do get to find clothing that feels really good and we get to share that joy with other trans people too. So just holding like the complexities of both of that and uh, wanting to really allow y'all to take what works for you, you know, leave behind what doesn't. And uh, we'll do our best to give you information and resources and hold that space to help you make some empowered decisions. But I will also share these two resources. They're the Trevor Project and the Trans Lifeline. They are amazing in general. They provide warm lines and hotlines for queer and trans folks if they need emotional support. Moving on, we have live captions. You can turn them on uh, with the live transcript. It is automated. We have a Q&A box, so you can click the Q&A to type in your questions. And when you're chatting in the chat, make sure that it says everyone instead of host and panelists. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, with that, also it is not on here. I don't know why the slide is gone, but this webinar is recorded and so Everybody will be receiving the webinar recording, the slide deck that Ray and I had created, uh, and also just like a list of different resources in there as well. So, yeah. 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 We wanted there to be lots of like practical things to take away from this as well. So Totally. Is there anything else, Ray, you want to say before I start? presenting the slides? No, not necessarily. I'm just so thrilled that so many of you are here. So thank you for spending your day or evening with us. Sweet. All right. Let me go ahead uh, and uh, get us present, get this presentation on then. Yeah, cool. Here we go. And thank you so much for being my tech and presenting slides for me. Of I'm course. <laughs> I got you. So as all of you know, you probably saw this when you signed up. Today is going to be about fashion outside the binary, dressing for your expansive identity. You've already met Rai and I am Ray. We'll get into a little bit more about ourselves in a second. This is what you can expect today. So first of all, we're going to go 
over what trans fashion means, our experiences of it, talking about our self-image in a changing body, being trans, and also all of the different things that allow for expansiveness and transition in our lifetimes. We will have a pause and reflection after that with a couple of questions for you. So if you haven't got a, a pen and paper handy, that might be something that you'll want to have with you if you like to write things down. Then we're going to go into some practical tips for wardrobe building with some of my experience with custom fit clothing um, and some tips and tricks. Then we'll do a live demo about how to take your own measurements. We'll wrap up with some more time for you guys to ask questions if you want. And then we've got a bit of a takeaway collaborative project and a resource list for you. So this is me. Um, I already told you guys I'm Ray. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a queer and trans non-binary settler here in Montreal. My background is in sociology, not in fashion. And I never really thought that I would be in the fashion world, but here I am. I created one of the first brands to make gender affirming clothing. I was definitely the, pers the first main brand to start doing customized gender affirming gear. That was 15 years ago. So I've been working in non-medical trans healthcare for 15 years. And I'm very excited to bring that experience to you all on top of the, the clothing company that I run. I do education work around trans integral business practices, diversity and marketing, marketing, non-medical gender affirmation care, lots of other things. And I've worked with NGOs, businesses, healthcare teams, universities, and all sorts of other stuff. So this is a little bit about what I do. The company that I own and run is called Origami Customs. You may or may not have heard of it already. We've been leaders in gender affirming care for 15 years. Essentially, it's custom-made lingerie and swimwear. We decided to take out the binary in buying underwear many years ago. And so now we allow for completely customizable sizing and also for gusset selection, which means like every item can be for any body, regardless of the shape and fit that you need. And everything is produced locally for us here in Montreal. I've trained an all queer and trans staff to make these garments. It's really, really important that we start here at home and outsourcing is just a thing that I do not feel comfortable with, but that's a whole other story. And we really created a framework for trans and gender diverse and queer integral staffing, which is a lot of the education that I work that I do around to teach other companies how to do the same. We also run a parallel community program that supports gender affirmation for folks with limited access. This program operates globally through a network of nonprofits, and they provide items to folks facing barriers to intersectional oppressions. We work with almost 100 organizations now across the globe, and that's a program that I've been building over the last seven or so years of my work so amazing <laughs> thank you that's me in a nutshell um, that's this is me exactly I mean y'all know me <laughs> <laughs> if you've been to a workshop here I'm I'm the only one that shows up like for the past two years anyway yeah I'm a trans femme person in Oakland California but a little bit more about, I guess, like my personal life. This has a lot of my work stuff. I've been trans and uh, medically transitioning for the past four years. I am, uh, you know, I say trans femme and I use she, her pronouns, but I would say like I have a lot more of like a gender fluidity, gender expansiveness in terms in like my roots instead of like being a trans woman and looking for my fashion to be in the binary. I love exploring just like juxtapositions in fashion and in clothing and expression and in style and uh, yeah just that in fashion and also in life I am like a drummer I make jewelry I love cooking I do ceramics I do wood like wood building all that stuff and so I love being able to being trans is just like it doesn't have to look any particular way excited to be sharing about some anecdotes and personal stories throughout this presentation as well so enough about me I'll pass it back to wow, Ray. Wow, you do a little bit of everything. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> basically. That's, that's it's like the ADHD for sure. Like, yeah, we do everything. Okay, so we're going to start with going into this knowing that we're going to use potentially like terms and ways of describing experience in bodies that might not resonate with you. So if we're using terms that don't land, just switch to something else in your head that feels really good, you know? So first we want to start by understanding some of the typical assigned gender at birth body structures that we have, key areas that, that might differ. And of course, this isn't always going to be true, but sites that we, we might see dysphoria and then we can look at more closely when we talk about dressing to accentuate or mask those areas, you know, 
for example, with assigned feminine at birth bodies, we've got like the hips, the shoulders, maybe your height is something that you're really aware of assigned male at birth bodies. We're talking about maybe like less ch chest tissue, the height as well, and the curves around the hips. Those are something that you might want to yet change or modulate in some way. You know, this might not be your experience, but we've got some tips if this is something that you're looking to change. Again, like not everyone's going to experience dysphoria like point blank or in the same way we're making some pretty broad generalizations here but i hope that you can hear it and take it with a grain of salt and and work with it in a way that feels more authentic to your experience Okay, so going a little bit deeper into that, when we're looking at fashion, we want to choose different proportions in a way that might make us appear more masculine or feminine. Sometimes when you're wanting to appear more feminine, you might have a goal of slimming the waist, making your appearance seem taller. You might want something that's a little bit tighter on the hips or the stomach. You might want something that's a little bit of a higher rise or something that minimizes the shoulders. So we'll get into some more like really concrete examples of clothing that you can buy and things that you can do to your clothing later that might hit these targets for you. For more masculine center folks looking at things that might make you seem more boxy that are made that your shoulders are going to appear a bit wider, something that's going to be a little bit more loose to the waist, something that doesn't accentuate the bum and the legs. And in pants, that usually means that something's going to have a bit of a, a lower rise to have that really like masculinized feel to it. So next, we're going to go over navigating size, gender, and societal expectations. This is a big one, so bear with us. As we all know, clothing can be gender-free and expansive, but it's also highly gendered. So how do we talk about those two things together, right? We live in a world of societal perception. We hate being seen, but we love being seen. And safety and freedom of expression can obviously be hindered. We're talking a lot about how to exist safely in the world and how that sometimes is at odds with the way that we want to be creative. So there's a lot of differing ideas here that we need to hold at the same time. Yeah. And a little bit about, you know, where we were doing this event and we wanted to share some personal stories in this too. And so Ray was asking me some questions around that, but I wanted to share around like, yeah, around the time that when my egg first cracked and I realized that I was trans was actually through, instead of clothing, it was actually through jewelry. Um, it was wearing hoop earrings for the first time. It was my partner at the time. They, they were helping me remove my studs in my ears and then they replaced it with hoop earrings. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror and it was just so strikingly, it felt so strikingly different in a way that was very scary and also very exciting and uh, connecting to that second point around hyper femininity and safety it was literally like in the same night we were going to an event and I felt so scared of going outside and it was just like me a he they with hoop earrings looking mostly mask at the time but the hoop earrings was just something that made me feel so visible and so naked and like vulnerable and I would say like you know a lot of a lot of my gender journey has been moving through a lot of those anxieties and obviously I feel a lot more comfortable wearing things like that now but I think that that fear it's it just it's just a moving post for me the fear is I still have fear of wearing really femme clothes I still have fear of going outside looking them and being approached by people or being harassed by people. And, you know, I think that that is one of the things that I realized it's, it's a lot deeper in my body in terms of what that anxiety and like the safety feels like for me now. There's something that's constantly on my mind in a way that is subconscious in a way that wasn't really present for me before. And so, you know, just wanting to give that story and also affirm that these things can feel really scary when you're trying to step into yourself. And also sometimes we do it anyway because we want to be ourselves too. So, yeah. Yeah, I totally feel you. That idea of having it like running in the back of your mind, like a script, that's super real. Yeah, thank you for sharing all this stuff as well. I really appreciate it. So some other things that we face when we're navigating all of these different intersecting identities and 
how society views them. There's added challenges, especially for gender non-conforming people who have larger bodies. And this is really important to talk about. Finding well-fitted clothes is difficult for people who fall outside traditional expectations of gender identity and expression, non-binary, trans, gender fluid people, everyone. But it also informs people's expectations of what a gendered person's body size should be. And people with larger bodies are often made to feel like their bodies are not in line with the expectations that gender holds, especially people who identify as women or their femme presenting. So we all know that that's going to be a lot more challenging. And I think that's a really important part of this conversation. Thank you. One other thing that I think is really interesting, I think about this all the time. So masculine and feminine are also... They're constructs located in our time and place, right? Like the way that we view those things is really based on the lens of growing up where and when we did. Obviously, most of us are going to have a similar lens in this part of the world, but also our, our identities play into that, you know, our family backgrounds and such, and our even our ages. But I love this. In the 18th century, masculine clothing was very different. It was very colorful. They used brocade. They used elaborately cut suits and jackets, and they wore pantaloons and britches and things like that. It was very flamboyant wigs and high heels. Like this is not, not what we think of as being masculine today. So this really is a good example of how things do shift over time. So some other things that were coming up for me as I was writing this. One thing that we'll see a lot these days in the fashion world is like androgynous clothing and what th that really means when people talk about like another word I heard a lot is ungendered and I think that's quite limiting in a lot of ways and like we can talk about what these words mean to us afterwards but I don't think that it encompasses the idea that gender can be expansive and gender is also important and it's like it it's embodied in in ourselves as well we're not trying to get rid of gender as a concept in the way that we dress our bodies are also shifting and changing over time I'm obviously people who are on HRT know this in a very real way, but we're talking about all the different factors too that can play into that over our lifetimes, our age, our weight, ability and disability, all of these other things that that change us over time, right? We're never in a stagnant body. One thing that I talk a lot about in my work is the difference between unisex and genderless clothing versus versus gendered clothing that is made specifically for trans and gender diverse people. So in my work, I really talk about, yes, everything is for everyone. It's customized. But it's specifically made for the gender diverse community in that like we're not trying to strip the like creativity from the fashion and say everyone should just wear this like shapeless beige sack and call it ungendered, you know, like, the gap can't just put up like a beige hoodie and sweatpants set and call it like the ungendered or like the genderless section like that's not really the goal here. Where's the new right? drop? Where's the origami customs? stage sack dropping yeah, is coming. <laughs> yeah but I think it's really important to look for places who are doing that work of of talking about like how is this actually for the trans and gender diverse community and feels like it's pushing that edges of like the different options that it gives people to expand their idea of what gender is and not just kind of like meeting in the middle and, and having like the low width common denominator for fashion. So here are just some questions that that came up while we were writing this. Thinking about your own self-image as a person in a body that's changing over time. When you're stepping out of judgment, find your self-expression from a place of curiosity and exploration. How do you know that there's an expansiveness happening versus having a view of yourself that comes from external pressures. How can you build trust with people in your community to help you do this? So are you following people online? Are there people in your life that you can look up to as examples of this kind of expansiveness or creativity? And and maybe you don't have a lot of examples of that. And maybe we can help you find some. And, you know, there's so many good examples out there of people who are really like pushing the edges of, of fashion. And how can accessories, not just our clothes, but jewelry, piercings, tattoos, and things like that play into also your self-expression? And I know Rai has a really good story about this. Oh, it's me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm forgetting. Oh, yes. Okay. The evolution and fits. 
I'm like, how much do I share about this? Do you remember what I was sharing with you? <laughs> Let's see. It was like, yeah, okay. I guess like in, in terms of timeline of self-discovery, I remember when I was first transitioning and I realized that I wasn't just non-binary. I wanted to be perceived as femme at, at a certain time. And it was a thing that I felt like I was so obsessed about. I needed to look femme. I needed to act femme. I needed to be perceived as femme. I didn't want to look masculine at all. I had this weird association of like masculinity as violence. And, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I had to work through at that time. But, you know, it was when I started medically transitioning. I was trying on just like hyper feminine clothes, like, like the skirts and the dresses and like the certain cuts to make me look more feminine and over time you know with the pandemic I was gaining a lot of I was gaining more weight and you know I think that internalized maybe there's some internalized transphobia and internalized fat phobia that was playing a role in sh- forcing myself to shift my lens of how I am seeing myself in relation to the world there is a time where I couldn't see myself in like mirrors because of this dysphoria and uh, it wasn't until I started to explore more around facial piercings actually it was my vertical library that like got me out of my intense bout of like dysphoria that it I realized that I was trying to model myself after these other like trans women that I really looked up to I thought that these other trans women were so beautiful and they were so gorgeous and they're such like baddie energy and uh, at the same time, it was hard because I real it was this realization that I I not that I couldn't get to that point, but like I wasn't there and I wasn't even sure if I wanted to be that. But it was the only example that I had in terms of what femininity can look like. And once I decided to go for my this facial piercing, it it like cleared the fog for me. It made me realize that actually this facial piercing makes me feel like I'm moving in a different direction from being like a binary trans woman. I think it makes me feel a little bit intangible, which almost cleaned the slate for me to be like, well, if this is making me not a trans woman, then what am I? And Uh, that started to like reshape my relationship to clothing and jewelry and accessories. And I started approaching things from a place of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I think that the changes of HRT for me, like having bigger, having like a bigger chest or having a little bit more curves or like my face getting softer, isn't actually me trying to go into femininity. It's to expand my options. Like I love Mm -hmm. looking butch sometimes. I love having clothes that literally my trans mask friends would be, it would be affirming for them as much as it's affirming for me, like the baggy pants and like the cropped muscle t-shirts, you know, or I could completely swap and flip and be like super feminine or I would go like all gothy type of energy too and it also expanded how like even like the hobbies that I started to do recently is as a result of that too I almost restricted the things that I enjoyed for the sake of trying to be quote-unquote feminine when that concept is wasn't really working for me you know and so that was kind of how I stepped out of, outside of my comfort zone. I mean, Ray, I'm curious if like if there's anything there that you resonated or if there's yeah. kind of like a similar story with you. Yeah, like I love hearing the way you're talking about these kind of like liminal spaces and, and gray areas. And I mean, we're, we're both like somewhere in the middle in our identities. And this might not be true for people who have more of like binary identities. But this is about like outside of the binary. So I'll share as well. One thing I realize I don't have any of my personal stories in this. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also very happy to share about my experience. <laughs> I think it was really interesting for myself. When I started taking testosterone, I realized that I didn't want to dress as masculine anymore and as my body did start to have those like very subtle shifts and changes because I didn't want to have a medical transition that really put me in a place where I'd be seen as a man or that I would see myself as a man in any way but like you said I just wanted to have more options like that's just a great way of putting it and I And I had heard this from other people too. And I was really curious to see if it was going to happen. Like I started wearing more feminine stuff, the more mask I looked. And it's just- That was me. I started (laughs) but in the opposite way. (laughs) Yeah. And I think, I think it's totally true what you're saying. Like we just, 
I mean, at least for me, I wanted to experience like a fuller range. And also like, I think a big part of it was my dysphoria was like lessened and I felt more confident and comfortable being more fluid in that way. So yeah, let us know if this is like resonating for any of you guys. We can, we can open it up in the chat afterwards, but I was really surprised, honestly, that, that that started coming up for me. Yeah, for sure. That was very much the same for me too. Like I started feeling more comfortable with like the quote unquote masculinity once I started having more quote unquote femininity, whatever any of this, you know, but it it, like, it makes sense. It's trans math. That's how it works. I think I want to be, I want to look like a boy as a girl. I want to be, yeah. yeah. And then some of my friends are like, I want to look like a girl. I want to look like a girl, but be seen as a boy. And Uh uh, both of those people, they're they're like this. They're the same person, basically, in opposite yeah, directions. It. Yeah. Um, and you get to just pick and choose pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing, too, is tattoos. Tattoos give me so much gender euphoria. Uh, mm-hmm. I have this, like, big chest tattoo. It's hidden by this, you know. But I have this, like, full, like, chest tattoo that just made me, like, love my chest even mm-hmm. more because it was just on this upper part I just wanted to show it all the time it felt like it was like a very symmetrical type of thing I have like tattoos on like my arms and it just makes me feel really connected to myself and it makes me really feel like this is this is even sometimes even more affirming than like HRT it, it's like I get to have this autonomy to shape my body however I want yeah, I mean, so. tattoos are so fascinating because they're a way of expressing ourselves. It's not seen as gendered as clothing is a lot of the time. It's m- much more like, like personal to our own identities. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel this way about tattoos. So it's like informed a lot more by what's going on internally than like an external pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll move us on to the next slide because we actually have some reflection questions for folks. So I'll let you take it away. Yeah, for sure. So this is a point where we're just going to stop for a second because we realize we are going through a lot of content. So it's nice to just take a little moment before we get into the more practical stuff. So these are some questions. Feel free to do a little bit of journaling. If you're called to feel free to put any anything that's coming up for you, feel free to put it in the chat. And if you would like us to comment on anything, if you have questions, we're also super happy to. I'll read these out as well. So which parts of your body do you relate to the best, which need a bit more love? And are these views fueled by a normative or cis lens of masculinity or femininity? And do you find ways to trust your, how do you find ways to trust your body and explore your sense of fashion identity outside of this normative lens? These are big questions. Feel free to just take a little chunk if you'd like. And ask us anything else that that you would like to know from this first section. Also, I'm seeing some folks in the chat relating to the, the intertwinement of like femininity and masculinity too which I think is really awesome and also just wanted to shout out someone's getting a double mastectomy tomorrow and I'm super super excited for you congratulations amazing I love to see that yeah 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 I got a question asking how did you all trust your body Ray if you want to take that how do we trust our body I mean I think I'm like developing an innate sense more than I ever did before of like trusting what feels like a yes and what feels like a no and I think like quite vulnerably this comes from like my work doing somatics experiencing just like knowing some some more of the cues of when I'm putting on clothing does this feel like it's the right thing for me or do I feel like it's a choice that I'm making to be in a certain space and sometimes that's the right choice because it feels like it keeps me safer but I know that going into it and I can say I'm gonna put this on for a particular reason and I'm gonna come home and like get into something that feels more like me but for me it's noticing like the feeling in my body, the way that I hold my body, the way that I walk when I'm wearing things that really resonate with my internal sense of self and gender. I love that. I would say building trust for me, (laughs) external validation. I'm going to be so real with y'all. I really needed, I really needed my friends to gas me up when I was wearing some things because I was Uh just so judgmental about myself and how I was looking because it just felt so foreign to me and really what that like it that is what it is it's just sometimes it feels really foreign to you it's like the euphoria doesn't hit immediately it takes you a little bit to adjust sometimes it does sometimes it hits like boom like immediately 
but oftentimes doing these things feels really scary and uh, you know then like the self-critique starts to come in and so there is I feel like there is a difference sometimes and it's hard to gauge the difference between I don't like this clothing this is not working for me versus Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable wearing this clothing yet or I'm not ready for it yet how do I get Mm -hmm. to that place where I can or how do I even get to the place where I can decide that this is something that I like versus this is not something that I like totally Um, and sometimes that takes a bit of like external validation some conversations with friends and stepping outside of your comfort zone for that you can always just like dip your toe in and be like okay you can just like try on this piece of clothing and like see how it feels you don't have to keep it on just like dip your toe in these like little moments yeah and what's great is you can take the clothes off (laughs) so you don't like it yeah exactly but seeing all the stuff in the chat love seeing all the stuff in the chat we got someone saying they love their leg hair yeah lots of legs pluck I've seen people growing to love their jawline and shoulders. Yeah, this is really beautiful. I also really resonate with the person who was talking about going to the gym and like, yeah, we might use that as a way of like building particular muscles that are like seen in certain gendered ways. But also for me, that brings such an innate sense of like strength or like the type of masculinity that I want to embody. And it just feels really good to be like making my strong so that's definitely a way that I experience gender euphoria and I love wearing gym clothes I love being a bro when I'm at the gym (laughs) you like being a jock is that gender for me I do yeah I really do that's such a euphoria moment for me yeah these are really beautiful thank you all for sharing Mm mm-hmm you know someone saying their hair is giving them a little bit of trouble at the moment Mm -hmm. um It makes them feel more femme than they want. Super real. Hair, I feel like hair is really, really challenging, honestly. So, you know, rooting for you and your journey of your hair discovery, for sure. All sorts of different body hair is imbued with, like, so many different values. It's wild. I remember the first time I thought that, or I remember when I was growing out my hair, I was doing it because I was like, long hair is feminine, right? And uh, Mm -hmm. I was growing it out without really any direction. And I just like didn't go to a hairstylist for a really long time until I saw a trans femme person with like short pixie haircut type of look. Mm -hmm. And it looked so freaking cute. And it actually made them look really, really femme. And yeah, it was just like, looked so pretty on them. And it blew my mind that like, oh, you can have short hair and still look quite feminine. And then sometimes the short hair can actually make you look more feminine than the long hair. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes the long hair can make you look more masculine than short hair and vice versa, all those different things. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, this can be a struggle. Yeah, don't be too hard on yourself. If this is still a challenge, we're all going through highs and lows of how we experience being in a body and like right now let's be honest it's a a particularly rough time try to have some grace yeah it's so lovely to see all these things being written down Mm -hmm. sweet thank you everybody for sharing really appreciate all of this ray do you want to move on and do a little bit of practical tips yeah definitely let's move into more, some more practical tips you guys feel free to keep putting things in there if you'd like to share if things Sweet. are coming up after <clears throat> so we're gonna go into a demo of how to take your own measurements if, if you, you want to follow along with me as i'm doing it to actually take your measurements you are more than welcome to do so we need a tape measure and if you don't have a tape measure which you probably didn't get ready because we didn't tell you to which is totally fair you if you have a piece of string or even like the cord for your laptop or your phone or something handy you can do this and write things down and then i'll show you how to like measure that afterwards normally you would have a tape measurement and you have like a pen and pencil so you can write things down yeah if you're using a string or a cord or something you'll need something to like mark it either a pen or a piece of tape or Twist tie, you all are inventive. I believe in you. This also will be recorded and you'll get it afterwards. So you can just 
watch along with it afterwards when you're ready. So I'm going to stand up so you can see my body. I might have to like tilt the angle a little bit a few different times. So bear with me. I also spotlighted you so people can see yeah. you more clearly. Okay, so and, a little bit there. Yeah. And for other folks too, like, yeah, we didn't ask you to bring a tape measure or anything, but we do have this webinar recorded. And there also is a video that Ray had done on YouTube that I will also make sure to send out too. That shows you how to measure your body. Yeah, I'm going into a little bit more detail there. So there's a couple, well, I'll preface this by saying that there's different ways of talking about your different body parts, obviously. I think for the sake of brevity, I will use what feels good on my body. But knowing that, for example, the difference between saying like across your chest or your breasts might feel different for different people. So please fill in the blank with the words that feel awesome for you. Um, I'll be going over some of the main measurements that you would take when you're getting fitted for most clothing, with the exception of if you were maybe getting a suit, you would want to get some extra ones, but mostly these measurements you'll be able to take compared to different size stripes that you'll find online at a retailer, or if it's custom clothing, like with me, you'll be able to input your specific measurements based on what clothing item you are getting, and then you'll have it made custom. So first we're going to start, I'm going to open up my tape measure here. I'm going to start at the chest line. So for me, that means that I'm going to take this behind my back. <clears throat> this you want to take, so the tape measure is parallel to the floor. You can see it in the back that it's not like falling down like this. You're going to make sure that it's up nice and high. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay, yeah. And I'm gonna take it across the biggest part of my chest and read that measurement, centimeters or inches, whatever works for you, just keep it consistent. Don't switch back and forth, that's a terrible idea. So for, for me, that looks like where my nipples are, but that's not the same for everybody. So just where the majority of the tissue is. And these measurements are taken at the same place regardless of your gender presentation and they can just be kind of filled in whether you're looking at masculine clothes or feminine clothes or neither in between clothes the body parts are just called different things so the next one i'm going to do is around the biggest part of my rib cage this is sometimes called the underbust when you're buying bras um, i have a quick question for you actually before we move on to the next one i'm seeing that you are okay Gonna turn on my video. I'm seeing that you are crossing the yeah. tape over your body, but you're not necessarily putting like the end point to the number. So how are you gauging what number the size is actually when you're doing that? Closer, so I'll show you. I'll do my my rib cage here. So I'm taking the end of the tape measure that's got the zero on it, and I'm touching it to the long end of the measuring tape. So I'm holding it against my body to a point where like it's tight, but I'm not like, I'm not like holding my breath and squeezing like this. And I'm also not like taking a, a deep breath and like holding my lungs full of air. So just so it fits snugly and then where the end of the tape touches, I'm reading that measurement. So on me, that's a 31 right here. I look at the measurement and I would write that down across from that part of my body. So if we're calling that the ribs, I'd write that down next to ribs. Amazing. Thank you. Just being sure that there's no other people asking questions in here as I go along. Okay, cool. This is making sense so far? Great. So another one that you'll probably use for most clothing that touches the upper half of your body is your, your waist measurement. So your waist measurement is kind of confusing. The next couple are actually kind of confusing because they're called different things with like men's or women's clothing. The waist measurement is actually taken at the natural waist. So that's like the, usually the smallest part here, not for everyone, but another really great, great way of finding it is like when you bend to the side, there'll be a part that creases normally. Here, I'm actually going to show you a really great demo. Okay, here. This is the side of my body. As I turn, or, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Fold, bend. You can see where, it's basically where my last rib is. That is your natural waist. It should be about two inches above your belly button, more or less. So I hold the measurement tape. Again, you don't want to like take a deep breath. You don't want to hold your breath just like breathing naturally, 
holding the tape. Yeah, not like super tight and not super loose. And taking that measurement. Cool. Double checking. All good. Yeah, nice. Okay. I'm going to tilt this down a bit. You guys see my dog in the background? He's going to help. This is Kaya. <laughs> okay. So the next couple, yeah, <laughs> he likes to help. So the next few are going to be measurements that you would take if you're getting any bottoms, particularly like underwear or pants. A men's, a men's pant is usually based on the measurement at what we call the high hip, but sometimes they call it the waist size, which is really confusing. I, it, <laughs> it is not, but the reference is not lost on me. <laughs> yeah, so the way that things are called is very confusing. The The high hip is the name of the part on the body, and that you'll want to input that if you're buying, like, a men's pants. And just a caveat to also say that, like, sizes, especially, like, pant sizes, the number doesn't mean anything. It's not, like, that's not the the, the actual measurement of the pants pants at some point we really deviated in like how we were going to describe how things are measured and you'll notice between brands now nothing makes any sense so like more and more people need to rely on using the actual body measurements and inputting that into a sizing system okay i'm going to tilt this down a little bit more so at the high hip that is basically where your pants or your underwear will sit if you've got like relatively low rise pants so for me I'm going to take the tape, sorry, I'm going to make it a little bit easier for you to see in a second. Here we go. And take it all the way around where that line is. You can do this on top of the clothing that you're wearing, as long as your clothing is relatively tight and you don't have anything in your pockets. If you're wearing like a fleece hoodie, maybe wear a t-shirt instead. But besides that, you're pretty good to take measurements just in like your normal clothing. It's really not going to affect the sizing that much. That's why I'm taking it over the clothing that I'm wearing. Oh, one thing I, I didn't mention though, you'll want to not be wearing a binder or a padded bra when you're doing the upstairs measurements because that of course will affect it. If you're measuring for a binder specifically, you'll want to wear like either just a t-shirt or nothing. We can get an accurate depiction of how your body moves when it's not being compressed. And then, yeah, <laughs> like that. So yeah, that's kind of like a compression specific measurement as with any compression garment. And you know, like my specialty is making gaps and binders. We really rely on people to take the actual measurements of their body. And then all of the math of the patterns that we make are designed around how much we need to compress that body. So if you're taking a measurement like on a piece of clothing that you already have, that's going to like totally skew our measurements. The same if you're already wearing a compression garment and then you take your measurements, that's not really accurate information. So yeah, try to wear as little as you feel comfortable. So I've got two more for you. Actually, no, I've just got one more for you. And then we'll talk about a few like outliers Okay, so the last one is your low hip measurement, and that goes around the biggest part of your butt. This one, what's important, a little more tilt. What's important is that your legs are like relatively close together, first of all. You don't want to be standing like super wide. And this one, you really want to make sure that the tape is parallel to the floor as well. You see in the back how it's like really going straight across. It's kind of hard to see when you're doing this yourself. It is really handy to do this when you have a friend who can help you, FYI, but I would like for you to know how to do it when you're on your own. Okay, so I'm gonna turn, you can see it. This is the biggest part of my butt. I'm wearing jeans. It's like kind of in the middle of the pocket. It goes all the way around the front like this. I'm gonna take that measurement there. And those are the main ones that you will need. I will briefly talk about things called rise and girth and gussets because those are words that you might encounter. They're quite specific to certain pieces of clothing. Let me sit down again. The rise is basically the, the vertical size from the crotch up to where the waistband of a garment sits. So when I make gaffes, this is something that sometimes comes up. You might find it as well in tailored pants or things like a bathing suit bottom. It's pretty specific. It's something that I can customize when I'm working with someone individually, but it's not something that you'll commonly see unless you're like 
getting a very formal pair of pants tailored. I'm going to answer this question actually, because it's a really good one for non-surgical male to female. Should we measure with or without breast and hip forms? That's a really good question. It depends on if you're going to be wearing the breast and hip forms with the garment that you're measuring for. So for example, I sell bras that you can wear with and without padding. And I always say like, if you're going to always wear it with the padding, measure with the padding, because we're going to need to build that frame around whatever tissue, whether it's like warm tissue or cold tissue is there. But if you want to be able to have the option of doing one or the other, I would say measure without and buy something that's really stretchy that can accommodate something like that, something like a Lycra or like a bamboo bra or something like that, that you can probably do both. Might be a little bit tricky depending on how big those pieces are. You are welcome. Two other words that I will describe in case you encounter them are girth, which is just hilarious to say out loud. And I will step back so you can see it on my body. It's kind of confusing. Girth is like this. And it goes all the way around between your legs and like back to the same shoulder. So it's like all of the amount of your torso. It's kind of weird. It doesn't come up very often, but if you see it anywhere, (laughs) that is how you would measure it. You would use it for like, if you were buying like a bodysuit or something that's really like specific. If you are a person who has a particularly short or long torso, you might want to know your girth measurement just so that you can compare like an item lying flat if you're buying something. For example, if you're buying off of like an Etsy seller, you could be like, hey, can you measure the girth of this garment? I don't, I want to know if it's going to fit my body or like, what does the girth stretch to if you know that you tend to be like shorter or taller than the regular standard girth of an item. So that's a little bit niche. The last thing I will answer this question first. Once we have the measurements, do we transfer them to the clothes themselves or how do we use these while we're shopping in person? While you're shopping in person, it's a little bit harder because you're, you might not know the measurement chart of the brand that you're using. I would look up their website ahead of time or like on your phone when you're in the store and and check their size chart. Or you can ask the staff to help you with that because every brand will have their own size chart that will say these measurements correspond to this size. So a really great example of this is if you go to a high-end lingerie store, they will do like a bra fitting in store. They'll take your measurements and then they'll be like, we know exactly what you need to buy. But that's kind of the only time that we experience this out in the shopping world in person. Yeah, so you kind of need to do your own research ahead of time to find also like what brands are going to work best for your body. You know, everyone creates their own size chart as a brand. And so some run short, some run wide. Like the way that the clothing is structured is really specific to each brand. And it's nice to get a handle on like where your body might fit best. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is gussets. And this is really specific to the work that I do talking about gaffs and also non-compression underwear that can be made for any body and any genitalia. But you should know what this is. So a gusset is basically like the piece of fabric that goes between your legs on a pair of underwear. So the width of that really determines whether or not like a penis or any other like type of genitalia is going to fit in a pair of underwear or like a swimwear bottom or a bodysuit or anything that touches that area. So if you're trans femme or if you're a person who wears gaffs or wants to, you might want to know what works best for you by like measuring a pair of underwear that really works well, finding styles that you know work well, and like obviously also taking into account that your body might be changing if you're on hormones. And this all is another measurement that might change over time as our bodies get bigger and smaller. For me, in the work that I do, people can request three different sizes of gussets for any piece of clothing, which really accommodates a lot of different body shapes for a lot of different reasons. But it is something to keep an eye on as well when you're out shopping, knowing which brands are going to have like really small gussets versus wide gussets and knowing which one might work best for you is just something to keep an eye on. If you're like, oh, I know that I can never buy underwear at Target because the, you know, the crotch is like this big and I need something that's like a little bit wider. So you'll just have something to keep in mind. Oh, thanks, Alex. Okay, so those are kind of the main measurements. Does anyone have any questions about that? I forgot to say that as you're taking these measurements, like write them down as you go and you keep a little list, keep it on your phone. So if you're out, 
you'll know how to reference them. There's someone in the chat asking about references for fashionable plus size clothing. Yeah, it is fine, hard to find good things. It, it kind of really depends on your style, but we do have some really good links at the end for specifically like non-binary plus size clothing that I'll make sure that, that you have access to. And I saw one in the Q&A talking about someone defaulting to mask presentation, but not really feeling gender euphoria, bridging the gap between feeling joy in dressing before considering replacing more parts of the wardrobe. Mm hmm. Yeah, okay. Which I think that we'll get more into during the, yeah, we have the reworking existing clothing section. But if we don't answer that question, feel free to pop that question again in the chat too. Yeah, I would say that as well. Is there a way of find measurements for higher waisted clothing, possibly above the belly button plus size without going custom? That you'll want to use the waist measurement depending on where the height of the clothing sits. Usually high-waisted clothing will sit at the natural waist. So that's a measurement you're going to want to use for anything. Yeah, you don't always need to go custom if you can find brands that are size inclusive and fit you well. Torrid is a really good example. Yeah, they're a pretty mainstream brand that has a lot of selection and do really good plus sizes. Oh, this is perfect. Girth, think of a pageant sash that goes along your neck, but instead of resting on your hip, it's going through your crotch. Yeah, that's that's actually exactly what it is. That's a fantastic visual for that. Great. Shall we move on to the next section? Yeah, I think so. Awesome. If something comes up for anyone later on the practicality of taking your measurements, feel free to ask me. So... Now we're going to go into practical wardrobe building tips. Yeah. And also you guys have amazing answers. So fantastic. All right. So these tips are going to be applicable to people in the process of experiencing changes, whether that's from HRT, all of those other reasons that our bodies fluctuate over time, like we mentioned. And it's important to note that elements of our non-medical transition. So of course, one of the non-medical elements that we're talking about can be gender euphoric garments, but also we can talk here about like prosthetics, wigs, electrolysis, things like that. They can complement a medical transition and they can also be legitimate on their own. So there's no real need to couple the medical and non-medical to have like a transition. It's really like we were saying, a pick and choose your own adventure. So one fantastic way that we can use binders and gaffs and other kind of non-medical devices like that in clothing is, is to see yourself more actualized in a future version. So for example, if you have this vision of yourself that's had top surgery, you can still hold on to that wonderful image and say like, this is my goal one day for whatever reasons, I might not be there yet, or I'm still waiting for that Using these strategies in the meantime can help like as stepping stones along that path and they don't always need to be forever. And some people do want to use binders or trans tape, for example, for all of their lives and they choose not to get medical intervention. So just like really holding space for all of those different paths to euphoria. Yeah, I love this idea of like an intermediate period. And like, there's there's so many wonderful ways that we have access to care now. And I, and I hope that we still keep having access to care that there's the, when, when, when we blend together these different strategies, that's like when we get the most unique presentations. And I'm starting to see that more and more now. There's not just one way of transitioning. <laughs> yeah, it could be forever. I love that. Okay, so we're going to go into some practical tips for creating different silhouettes. Again, we're talking about masculine and feminine, but feel free to use words that work better for you. Not everyone wants also to have these certain silhouettes, so grain of salt again. So when we're building a wardrobe that's more tailored around a uh, femme presentation, here are some things that you can start to look for um, in the clothing pieces themselves that will accentuate the classical version of femininity, let's call it. So if 
Tucks and darts in a bodice. For those who don't know what that means, there's there's a difference between a dress shirt or like a formal shirt, like a button down that's made for men and that's made for women. So you definitely want to look for things that are going to accentuate your body. I'll stand up again for a second. They'll have tucks and darts, which are like little kind of triangles of sewing. You'll see them usually like right here and maybe at the waistline. And so, you know, those are to create curves in a clothing item that's usually flat. So really opposed to like a men's dress shirt, which is made to make your shoulders seem like flatter and wider and more boxy. So this is like a really little subtle difference that you can look for when you're buying clothing. Cutouts in the shoulders. I love these. They've got a fun nickname and I can't remember what it is anymore. Someone should tell me in the chat if they remember. But something that, no, not a raglan. A raglan is like when it's cut like this. This is like when there's like a like a whole section missing on the shoulders. And this can be really great in cold shoulders. Yeah, thank you. Um, in like making the shoulders seem less wide. As well, A-lines are really, really fantastic for creating this hourglass, if that's the shape that we're going for. Three-quarter length also is really great for like minimizing height. So in both skirts and pants, wearing something that's not all the way to the floor. Fantastic. Accentuated waistlines, like I said, if you're into vintage clothes and thrifting, using those 50s styles to accentuate right at that waist, like we were talking about. I mean, shapewear is another really great example of this that is made to create that hourglass figure. If you're someone who's already using like hip pads and breast forms, you're probably familiar with clothing that, that fits that shape and how we can modulate and affect the body to create more of that shape. As well to create kind of like openness in in the in the front body depending on you know what you've got going on for for breast and chest tissue a really deep v can be really really flattering what i would say to avoid is a boat neck which is the one that kind of comes across here because that will make your shoulders look wider and i just love a deep v like any gender deep v fantastic Flat chest GP, so good. So here are some other things on the, on the on the other side of the binary, let's call it. Looking at if you want to masculinize the way that you are perceived for yourself and others. So we want to look at shirts that are a little bit shorter. I know as trans masks, we always want to have these like big baggy shirts. Try to find ones that are going to cut right at the belt line of your jeans, take them up a couple inches. And like, this has become much more in fashion these days. And so you can find a lot of shirts that are already like this, but if you can even just like cut a couple inches off the bottom, personally, I don't even think you need to hem them. That's totally your call, but I think it looks great without. Like someone was mentioning raglans before. A raglan is a shirt where the seams go across here, like a normal t-shirt, the seam is on this shoulder, right? And it's like a baseball tee. So a baseball tee style is really, really great for making your shoulders seem wider and your chest seem broader. A raglan. Boxy fits again. So like finding brands that make more of like a square shirt or sweater or whatever you're going for. Um, and, and you'll see that like the shoulder seams fit a little bit wider. You'll see that they're more like straight cut like a high neck like what I'm wearing this is just kind of like a standard t-shirt but a nice high neck can also really help with that it kind of creates this line where like this part of your body seems more angular rather than something that has a, no a lower neckline like we were talking about with the shirts before you want to avoid something that's darted if possible it does like subconsciously really signal femininity in this weird way it's like such a small difference in the way that a shirt is cut but if you'll if you see like a women's dress shirt, it does kind of like flare out at the hips and that can be like a really big tell, but we might not notice that if we're just like thrifting and we're like, I picked up this shirt because I love it. So yeah, just keep an eye out for subtle things like that in the way that things are constructed. Yeah, shoes are so long, you tuck them into your pants and then pull them up a bit. That's also a fantastic idea. Then you don't have to cut them. Yeah, okay, this is something that I am also guilty of. A, a smaller, a, a more fitted shirt will actually make for a more masculine look than a baggy oversized look. I know that everyone loves this baggy oversized look and it looks fantastic. But if you want to try to make your body look a little bit more masculine, something that's like, it doesn't have to be super, super tight. I know this is tempting for people who bind also. They want to have something that like 
kind of hides their chest, but something that falls flat that isn't skin tight is actually going to make it less obvious that you're wearing a binder. Straight cut jackets are another fantastic piece. Jacket is really built to overemphasize the shoulders. And I mean, of course, some of them have shoulder padding in them. So that's just always a, a fantastic piece to masculinize. Vertical panels, like for example, a loose shirt over a tee. So like anything that's like adding this like bulkiness in a vertical way, yeah, really helps to like build out the visual of the body. And there's so many good comments here. This is fantastic. Fake platform boots to hide height. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Wearing things a little bit more fitted. I know it's kind of magic. We were taught wrong. Love a shoulder pad. I mean, for anyone, honestly, a shoulder pad is having a moment. So Beside the masculinizing and feminizing, here are a couple other things that you can keep in mind. If you can afford it, having things tailored is really incredible and it's not as expensive as people think it is. Often if you take your clothes to like a dry cleaner, they'll offer a service where they can tailor things and it's a lot more affordable than taking it to, to like a tailor who does suiting. Oh my gosh, Hawaiian button-up shirts. I just got the best Hawaiian button-up that's like short enough that it actually fits my body. It's like actually a square. It was like the ultimate score. Yes, I love that. Having trans fashion inspiration rather than just consuming media that is like straight and cis and doesn't look like you. This is for me like the most important takeaway from all of this. Like find the people who are doing work who are hiring people that look like you, who are creating things for people that look like you. Um, we're going to give you some really good resources at the end of this and a fun little project where we can explore that a bit more. But yeah, if you're not seeing yourself reflected in the media around fashion, it's just going to always create this distance of like, I'm never going to look like that. But there are people who are designing for the trans community more now than ever. As well as queers, we love thrifting. And thrifting is great because styles really change over the eras, right? So like, if you have a particular aesthetic that really works for your body, like if you're trying to feminize and that like 50s cut really works for you, you might not find a lot of brands these days who are making that silhouette, but going thrifting will let you hone in on an era that really works for your presentation and your body. You know, the like the shoulder pad suits from like the 80s, maybe that's like your grandpa aesthetic that you can lean into. People did in a lot of different ways have more defined silhouettes than we do now. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dad and grandpa styles, they're really coming back. Absolutely. And yeah, just finding brands that work with your body shape and sticking to them know where you can go where it's not going to make you feel terrible. Okay, so we've given you a lot of information. We're going to let you guys let it sift down a little bit. If you have anything that you want us to expand on from both those practical tips, talking about different styles of clothing or questions around taking your measurements, questions around custom clothing, questions on where to shop, yeah, totally fair. And we also have a resource on the, we're creating a, like a trans fashion inspo board on Pinterest mm -hmm. that I can pull up in a second. But Ray, if you want to take the questions in the Q&A box while I load that up, then yeah. I can get that set up afterwards. Oh, of course. Yeah, definitely. I know some of you have to have to go now and that's totally fine thank you for joining us the unisex clothing idea is an interesting concept yeah i have feelings about unisex clothing <laughs> obviously <laughs> can be fantastic can be also like weirdly dehumanizing online and local shopping yeah definitely like we talked about if you know your measurements shopping online is really great you know i don't love telling people that it's fantastic to like buy things knowing that you might have to return it but it is a benefit of buying online uh yeah you'll get access to the next section which is building some trans inspiration vision boards so that will be a part of what goes out after this absolutely if you have to leave early yeah, Pinterest is really, really great for fashion inspiration. Um, so I drop the link in here. If y'all feel like you have the time and want to stick around and you want to open that up, that is something that we can use together for this next section. 
for, for customizing clothes, if we bring something in that we find from a thrift store or elsewhere, can they replicate it or extend the garment? That's a great question. Some people will be able to. It totally depends on the garment and the skills of the person you're bringing it to. I would say someone who specializes in tailoring might be the best place to go. Replicating is definitely harder to find, especially if it's a complicated garment. And like this really depends on if you live in a big city and just like if there are people who have that skill set. But it is possible. Absolutely. I used to do that. People used to send me like Halloween costume ideas or like bathing suit ideas. And I would just from one picture, like recreate it. And it was a lot of work and I don't do it anymore. Yeah. Okay. So this person is also looking for for a particular size of clothing. I can't find any clothing except at drag queen stores that I found online. I would say if it's possible and accessible for you, then custom fit might be the way to go. I would be happy to help you out with that, but I know that there's a lot of other brands as well who, who offer outside of their standard sizing system. That's always something that I'm happy to design for. It really depends on what you're looking for, obviously, because I'm a bit niche. Cool. I forget if we tackled the question in the Q&A boxes, that first one around this person saying that they default to mask presentation, but they're tired and it's what they have the most of. They mm -hmm. haven't felt gender euphoria, save for the moments they appreciate when they styled their thrifted skirts. How can right. they bridge the, this gap to feeling joy in dressing before considering replacing more parts of their wardrobe? Yeah. Honestly... From my experience, both personally and in my work, I think undergarments can be really fantastic for that. It's something that people on the outside don't really, don't always have an idea of what's going on underneath your outer layer. So I hear this a lot actually from people who want to try like tucking for the first time. It's something that only you know that it's happening for the most part if you're in like a work scenario or just out on the street. So it's something that you could try out and then have your like mask presenting clothes on the outside and just try out how that feels internally of having like kind of this protection, but also knowing that what's closest to you and the internal is more of a reflection of yourself. And just kind of checking in about how that feels and maybe buying different pieces to affirm that are hidden. Right. Next one is, if you just started using hormones, how often should you check your sizes? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, that, I mean, that's really going to be individual as well in terms of like what your dosage is and just your body. I know people who like every month have a different size and they'll kind of go through growth spurts too. I think that that's quite common at different like times in your hormone use. So at the beginning, I know that you're going to like kind of reform pretty quickly. For me, like my my size went like a lot bigger really quickly and then kind of dropped down and then kind of stabilized after a while. And I think that that's common for quite a few people. So I would imagine like in the beginning, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really personal, but maybe every month or so, if you're getting custom clothes made, another thing that's important to note about that is if you're getting custom clothing, there's usually a bit of a wait time because it's not pre-made, right? Like for example, if you're getting clothing through me, it's about four weeks while we create the garment. So you can send in your measurements and have something made. And then when it gets closer to the time when like, we actually make that garment for you. You can remeasure and update your measurements. I know that I'm always happy to do that for people. And if you are doing custom, other brands might be willing to as well. Also, I just wanted to add a little bit yeah. in the first question that I had, uh, that you had answered. When you're talking about having more mass, clo mass presentation clothing mm -hmm. and not having things that feel more gender euphoric, that's something yeah. that I face a lot actually sometimes. And also when it gets cold too, you, you kind of just want to bundle up, which may... You know, you just want to feel comfortable and cozy. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you are someone who enjoys or wants to experiment with jewelry, I would highly, highly recommend jewelry as a place to experience different types of gender affirming feelings or euphoria, even within the same outfit. Like I, you could wear your baggy pants and like a long t-shirt and that might feel like a mask presentation for you. But then if you throw on hoop earrings, then you're kind of like, you're you're kind of switching it up, you know, or if you're having like danglies, or if you have like a necklace, or if you have like a choker, you know, those small little things can really change how an overall outfit looks like. It's mm. like, if you don't have the clothing that feels affirming, think about the accessories that feel affirming. Yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. I would even say things like dyeing your hair, even if it's like a, a like a natural color or something that like kind of quote unquote like suits your gender that people are perceiving you as like you'll know that there's a subtle difference and it might just give you kind of that boost of confidence, but it's still like quite yeah hidden. Yeah. yeah. This person said, how can you find which clothes make you feel euphoric, especially if your existing clothing has previously been limited to t-shirts and jeans? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's expensive to try to go out and buy a whole new wardrobe. So honestly, I would say like find a place that has like pretty accessible styles and a range. And I mean, thrift stores are so good for that. Try to find one or two pieces that you're like, I don't really know, like maybe this is me, but it's not so much of, of an expense that it's really going to harm you financially if it turns out to not be the right thing. But that experimentation is really important right at the beginning. So I like to pick up something and like wait until I get it home and kind of I mean, you can try it on as well when you're shopping, but like wear it around a little bit and be like, what comes up in my body as I'm feeling this? Like, what is it like to style with other pieces? You know, sometimes something might feel really feminine, but if you put like, I don't know, a dress over pants, it might feel different for you or put like a jacket over it. You know, there's lots of different ways of playing around with it. So I would just say like play as much as possible in a place that feels safe for you. I would also say, I mean, some places have, some cities have little communities, like queer communities that do clothing swaps. Mm -hmm. You have like queer and trans communities Mm -hmm. that do clothing swaps. That is like one of the best places to go because I feel like we change and evolve every three months. And so our wardrobe ends up changing every three months. And so if you go to a clothing swap, you can get somebody's entire wardrobe (laughs) basically there. And then- I love that gender. We're just going to trade. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This person said a lot of femme clothing they get has this extra space by the armpit to accommodate breasts, they suppose. Being AMAB, this kind of gives their tops a bat wing appearance. Mm-hmm. Is there a style, cut, or measurement they should be aware of to get more form-fitting tops, especially around the armpit? Yeah, I'm imagining that you're talking about maybe like a tank top that has like a bit of gapping here. Am, am I reading that question correctly? Or maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you're talking about like a long sleeve. I'm not sure. That was kind of what was written in the, yeah, in the question. Well, if you're in the chat, let me know if I'm reading this correctly. I mean, tailoring is always a really great thing. If you find a piece that you're super in love with and you don't want to give up, okay, you're thinking about long sleeve stuff. Then I mean, if it is, yeah, if it is something that you really want to invest in, you're like, this is the shirt I need to have. You can definitely have it tailored because that is something that's taking away the material to make it fit more smooth and flat. And that's quite an easy tailoring process. If you were like, I want to make more room, that's something that's a lot more challenging too to do but there's probably going to be a lot of other styles out there so yeah just look for things that already sit flat mostly you're going to want to be looking for stretchy fabrics because stretchy fabrics don't need to use that same type of tailoring to accommodate for different chest sizes so yeah if you're looking for clothing something that is just like a flat front that will expand to accommodate and that should get rid of some of the gapping on the sides Well, how do you find femme clothing for tall and broad shoulders? Femme clothing for tall and broad shoulders. It's really about, I mean, it's dependent on the styles that you like. Finding brands that maybe specialize in that look or aesthetic. Tall is really like, if you're not going custom, just finding a brand like off the top of my head, I know like H&M is like, a taller brand. So you might have to do a little bit of experimentation. Again, like doing this on the cheap is like going to clothing swaps and thrift stores and finding things that fit you and then like going to those stores. Broad shoulders, like again, if you use something that has stretch materials, you don't have to worry too much about like where the seam is hitting. So looking at something that's like a softer, um, yeah, a softer material, then I think in general, it's just like, stretch materials are going to be a lot easier on on people whose bodies are shifting and changing for sure this person i'm just kind of i'm reading it word by word so don't <laughs> don't at me <laughs> this person said any tips for a trans feminine nb with the body shape of danny devito <laughs> danny devito <laughs> okay so we're looking at like i'm assuming like shorter and wider shapes i'm like trying to recall devito <laughs> specifically trans femme clothing like there's going to be a lot of things that you can buy and then tailor 
Because again, like when you're taking material out of clothing, if you're making it shorter, that's really, really easy to alter. So again, if you have something you love, just take it to a tailor, make it shorter. Yeah, someone who has like a bigger middle section, again, stretch materials are really great for that. And Empire Waste, that's something that sits right here, can be really nice and flattering. It's totally dependent on your personal style. Like if you want dresses, that can be really cute and something that's like really flowy. If you want something a bit more fitted, you could also go like the opposite way and do like a big jacket that's like really cute on top of something more femme. I think that that's really flattering and it kind of like evens out and like squarifies the shape if that's more the silhouette that you're going for. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and I, I would say like one last thing too is like, like you fit in the clothes, the clothes, like you, the clothes fit on you, you don't fit into the clothes. So I say, I, this is something that I came across when I was gaining a lot of weight. I, I was trying to fit myself into like the smaller sizes or I try to like hold on to the smaller size pieces mm. because I was like, at some point, hopefully I'll like lose weight. That's mm -hmm. not, that's not really reasonable to expect necessarily. And so having to make the adjustment to find the clothing that does fit your size does make you look like just a lot better overall. It also makes you feel and look a lot more confident too when you're wearing things that do fit you properly. So. Yeah, that could be really challenging. Like as we're saying, like our styles change, our bodies change constantly and it can be a lot of like upkeep, but absolutely like dress for the body you have now because <laughs> we don't know what it's going to be like and it's not the same as it was before and that's totally fine yeah, exactly this person had a question around how soon do you feel body changes when starting hormones this isn't a fashion specific one but we can still give a little answer because you said that you're on t2 right yeah yeah again it's really dose dependent my experience has been on like quote unquote a half dose but i would say for most people the majority of the changes are happening like within the about the first six months it's really a, quite a different timeline and also depending on the hormone. Body changes, I, if I were to guess, and this is like, I'm not a medical professional, are, are, are not going to happen in the first like two or three months probably. Um, and then changes obviously can like keep happening for years down the road. Yeah, I'd say like the most notable changes will happen around like the three month part mm -hmm. or like not noticeable as in, oh, you were there already. But yeah. noticing some shifts happening some shifts will happen, happen between like the one to three month mark. And for hormones, like it could really go not just on the one year, but it could really go to like five years before yeah. you have like the full effects. And sometimes you even get more beyond that. It really is body dependent. It's also like genetics dependent. It depends on like the type of dose that you're taking. Is it injections? Is it a patch? Is it a gel? Sometimes yeah. your body interacts with them differently. And so, yeah, I would say like, take your time. And uh, if you do want to do that, like measuring, you know, if you're wanting to keep an upkeep on body measurements, I'd say do it like once a month. If you want to do that once every two months, if you're wanting yeah. to get accurate sizes. This next question is, do you have any tips for someone in a red state who wants to dress cool enough to be clocked by the community, but not <laughs> cool enough to be clocked by those against me? <laughs> I'm Canadian, so maybe I'll let you answer that one. I'm in Oakland. I, <laughs> I'm, I don't know if I am qualified to answer that question. I am not in a red state. Yeah. Um, but if, you know what? People on Reddit probably know that. And I find really the resources of people who are in similar positions, whether that's people in your community that you can reach out to, or yeah, just trying to, trying to access more information on, on forums. Yeah, I, I would say. One... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. There was just one question that we skipped over earlier that I think is really important that I want to make sure that we go back to. It's from Sabrina, and it's about apple-shaped bodies, and it's more like measurement specific. So, do you mind if I go, go back ahead. and make that one before we end? Okay. So, this person's saying I find the measurement process to be trickier because they're they have an apple-shaped body. So, I don't know your pronouns, Sabrina. I have wide shoulders, narrow hips, and about the same size. Sorry, narrower hips about the same size as my waist. My fat collects in my belly. So when I measure myself, I worry that it can create a false number. Is this more of an issue to be fixed by tailoring or adjusting how I measure myself? I haven't cracked the code for apple body shapes. This is actually really important. This is something that I get a lot. And it's actually something I design around a lot. So I did want to make sure that I go back to it. You don't need to take your measurements any differently. What I would say that like having good custom fit stuff will be more important depending on, I want to say like the intimacy of the garment, like the tighter it fits, 
to your body, the more chances that you're not going to get a, a great fit because there's like, you know, it's just like you need to have more specificity. You want to take your measurements exactly the same. This is what I tell people when they're sending in their measurements. Like, you know, when I say like, this is usually the biggest part of the body. Sometimes it's not, but you still want to use those same like level markers, like, you know, like where the natural waist is, even if the biggest part of your body is between your high hip and your waist. And you could like leave a message. For example, if you were like getting something made by me, you could leave a message and be like, actually like around my belly button is the biggest part. But for us to be able to customize a garment, making sure that you're like still using the same standards will allow us to input into our like system of creating a piece, if that makes sense. Of course, you can have things tailored that are going to fit your body better afterwards, but that's just like the technical side of like, if you're sending your measurements to someone. So yeah, I hope that makes sense. Great. Thank you. There's one question around, uh, do you have any tips or suggestions for trans femme folks who are looking to tuck and uh, their size is bigger? Yeah, definitely. Finding brands that make your size. I offer three gusset widths, which is like, there's like a standard middle of the road one. There's like a narrow one, which is what you'd normally find in like traditional cis women's underwear. And then there's like a larger size. So for people that have like more going on downstairs, there is a little bit of, there's more flexibility in the way that you can customize that garment. I don't know of a lot of other places that do that, but there's probably brands of gaffs that already make them a little bit wider. Again, like you might just want to like go on a forum like Reddit or something and see if other people have had the same experience and maybe you can get some other information around other brands that would work for them. I would also be happy to create this, the things that you need, obviously. But uh, yeah, I'm sure that there's like, there's lots of other brands that are going to be on the larger side, just like any brand, right? Like they're not all made the same. Well, the last question in the Q&A is, are there any trans-focused brands you'd recommend that they said they love origami customs, but they can't just go out wearing their gaff? <laughs> totally. That makes sense. You need something on top of it. I think that's actually a perfect segue because we have created a resource for you guys. Oh, yes, we did. Do you want me to show the presentation or do you want me to go to the Pinterest? Why don't you go to the Pinterest? Yeah, we don't okay, cool. need our notes to talk about this. So okay, we cool. created a Pinterest board of... Trans brands and trans models, which, you know, we might have made some assumptions in looking at these things. <laughs> Hopefully I think it's like them. very like queer and trans focused. Yeah. So I'm just going to yeah. put that. But we very much. Best, yes. I'm sorry. Fashion board. Model here that are like, I'm cis. How dare you? But yeah, we, we really know that there aren't a lot of resources out there to try to like find a unique style that feels trans and feels reflective of your identity. We wanted to leave you with the exploration activity if you choose it to kind of go through this and see if anything resonates with you. See if the people you're finding people who look like you or what you want to look like. If you're finding styles that you're like, wow, I never would have imagined that on myself, but maybe I can try to find this particular piece when I'm out looking next. Maybe this silhouette I could try to flatter my body. We did try to get a good range of body styles and identities it's not exhaustive, obviously. So we're also hoping that you folks might want to help other people who have seen this and other people who can access this by, of course, adding anything that you would like to it. But yeah, we really wanted something that could exist in the world in a collaborative way to help you explore more as just like one tool. And of course, if you're seeing models and brands here that you like, then you can go to the pin and you can like go find out more about that brand. I added some of my favorite trans brands that you'll see throughout. And then, yeah, we do also have a, a, a list of resources in link format that can give you some more ideas as to, yeah, where to start if you're looking to get more information. There's a lot of really good like blog articles that go a little bit more in depth. There's a couple lists that have other trans brands. There's a little bit more like writing about what we're talking about today. And then of course there's like both of our websites and there is the, um, the more in-depth video on how to measure yourself. So lots of things. Yeah. <laughs> lots of things. Trying to give so many resources, all the 